Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tom McNally. I'm the Dean of Libraries, and it is my great pri privilege to welcome you to the Ernest F. Holling Special Collections Library. How many people here are immediate or extended members of the Westmoreland family? Would you raise your hands, please? You know, this evening is, a, is in many ways a real family affair, and it is great to see so many of the Westmorelands here. As many of you know, this isn't the first time we've attempted to have this event. Uh, we tried once before. <laughs> okay, this is Velcro down here. There's something wrong here. We paid $25 million for this building. Yes. Uh, last October, Superstorm Sandy held our speakers captive in the Northeast, and we had to cancel this event. We felt confident that if we waited until April, we would be safe from the weather. I must confess to you that over the weekend, I found myself continually switching to the Weather Channel, <laughs> searching for snowstorms that were attempting to sneak their way onto the East Coast. I scanned the Atlantic for hurricanes, but the weather has held, and we are finally together for an evening to discuss, celebrate, and examine the life and the career of General William Westmoreland. I don't often get the chance to uh, sing the praises of my staff. But I'd like to say a few words about the folks who made tonight possible. Our event staff and the staff from the South Carolina Library and the South Carolina Political Collections put this event together not once, but twice. That's not an easy task. In my experience with events, when you plan an event and it doesn't take place, you lose your place in line. And it's, it's hard to get your speakers, it's hard to, hard to get your audience back together again. But here we are, and it's not by accident. It's due to hard work and perseverance by one and all. I also want to personally thank our speakers. The fact that you signed on twice really speaks to your commitment to this program. And I want to thank Kitsy, and I want to thank your family for your patience as we put this program back together and for your continuing support for our library and for our university. At this time, I would like to welcome to the podium the director of our South Carolina Political Collections, Herb Hartson, and I want to warn Herb and the rest of our speakers, watch out for the Velcro. <laughs> Thank you very much. just a little bit about the Westmoreland collection, the papers itself, and then I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, but uh, before I do that, I'd like to thank ETV producer uh, Mark Adams, uh, who created a documentary on General Westmoreland uh, for the Hall of Fame and for his employer, South Carolina uh, ETV. Um, if you didn't get a chance to see it here, you can uh, see it on YouTube. And if you haven't seen it, it's a little over 11 minutes, and it's just wonderful. Um, in fact, I think Rip gets about as much screen time as uh, anybody else. But it's a, a very nice program. And just like Tom, I also want to acknowledge Kitsy in the audience. Uh, when we went after the collection, uh, the Westmorelands were just ideal donors and made sure that we got everything that we needed uh, to make the collection uh, the standout um, accumulation of papers that it is. And uh, like everybody that gets a chance to, to meet Kitsy, uh, I fell under her spell. Her charm and grace are just exceptional. And uh, we're really uh, just so delighted to have you here tonight. I first met General Westmoreland in 1998 when he was 83 years old. He was suffering from the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, uh, still a very compelling speaker and physically fit, as he proved when he raced down the steep ladderways of the USS Yorktown in Charleston Harbor. <laughs> 
they had provided him with some complimentary storage for some of the many things he had retained from throughout his career. And he took me to the ship to show me those things to see if there were things that we might like for our collection. And it was literally all that I could do to keep him in sight. <laughs> now you've got a picture. It's kind of dark. Those ladders are really steep. He's 83 years old. I'm 34 younger than, years younger than he was at the time. And it literally was all I could do. To, I was so deathly afraid that he was going to leave me behind. <laughs> I was going to wander around that ship for days trying to find him. Uh, and that's one thing that I always think about when I think about the general is, is just how remarkably uh, fit he was. Uh, both mentally and physically, really almost right up until till the end. Um, the collection is at the Carolinian. We have a wonderful exhibit. I hope you got a chance to see it. It truly is just a fabulous collection. Uh, documents his life from childhood uh, to the grave. Uh, wonderful, wonderful things. Brian Keeney and um, or, I'm sorry, Brian Cuthrell and Craig Keeney uh, did the processing. Um, over 100 feet of material, a huge collection. Again, documenting the general's youth, his education at the Citadel and at the United States Military Academy at West Point, his experiences as an Army officer from 1936 until his retirement as Chief of Staff of the Army in 1972. The collection reflects his stellar performance during World War II and the Korean conflict, and as superintendent of the U.S. Military Academy. It fully documents the general's life after retiring from active duty. This included a strenuous speaking schedule devoted to building an appreciation for the remarkable service of our troops in Vietnam, and that was something he was very proud of, that he had crisscrossed the country uh, to speak and support the troops. The collection also documents his 1974 gubernatorial campaign, the publication of his 1976 memoir, A Soldier Reports, and the landmark 1982 lawsuit against CBS. We are joined today by a, a wonderful panel to reflect on the general's life and career. And I'm going to introduce each of our three speakers individually. Our first speaker is Colonel Paul Miles. Colonel Miles teaches military and diplomatic history at Princeton University. He is a graduate of the United States Military Academy and holds an MA in Modern History from Oxford University and a PhD in History from Princeton. He served as an officer in the Army during the Vietnam War, commanding an engineer company at Cam Ranh Bay, and I probably mispronounced that, but that's uh, for which he was awarded the Wheeler Medal of the Society of American Military Engineers. He is currently at work on a biography of Admiral, Admiral William Leahy, a fascinating figure who served as ambassador to Vichy France and Chief of Staff to Presidents Roosevelt and Truman from 1942 to 1949. Most important for us today, Colonel Miles served as an aide to General Westmoreland and remains a close friend to the Westmoreland family to this day. And we owe Colonel Miles a great debt uh, for all of his help in bringing the Westmoreland collection to the USC libraries. So, Colonel Miles, the floor is yours. Well, I would like to thank her for that very gracious and generous introduction, and thank uh, Dean McNally, and I believe that I'm speaking on behalf of my uh, fellow panelists, thanking uh, the Dean and his um, staff for their attention to making the arrangements for this special um, event. And on a personal note, it's nice to be back in South Carolina. <laughs> Why? Because I spent a year at the Citadel before I moved to another military academy up north. Beyond that, my branch of the Miles family hails from Barnwell. My grandfather grew up in Barnwell before he volunteered for the cavalry in the uh, Spanish-American 
My assignment this evening to discuss the mind of William Westmoreland. And by mind, we mean not the mechanics of the brain, but how someone approaches a problem, how someone addresses particular issues. In other words, an individual's mental outlook. And I will discuss William Westmoreland's outlook on three topics, issues that are of special significance to military historians. And the three are, one, the relationship between war and politics, and second, civil-military relations, and third, the Army's role in society. To begin with, William Westmoreland understood and embraced the Clausewitzian concept that war is an extinction, an instrument of policy. Now, I'm referring to the philosophy of war developed by the Prussian general Karl von Clausewitz, arguably the preeminent theorist of war in the Western world. Writing both as a philosopher and a historian, Clausewitz <coughs> observed that war is a continuation of policy by other means. As he put it, the political object is the goal. War is the means of reaching it, and the military means can never be considered in isolation from the purpose of the war. Now it's commonplace for officers today to be educated in clouds of Indian <coughs> terms at West Point, at the Army's Commanding General Staff College, at the Army War College. But this was not the case with Westmoreland's generation. Few officers had been schooled in the Clausewitzian tradition. What historians have called the rediscovery of Clausewitz by the American military establishment had not occurred. So how do we account for Westmoreland's outlook? There is one straightforward answer. When I went to Washington in 1969 to be interviewed for the position of aide de camp, I spotted in his library a copy of Own War, Clausewitz's classic work. Westmoreland had read and studied Own War. Consequently, it's not surprising that during the Vietnam War, he repeatedly emphasized the political dimensions of that conflict. Westmoreland underlined the fundamental political nature of the war in what might have been his first interview with a major news organization after assuming command in Vietnam. When he was interviewed by Blair Clark, the head of CBS News, in August 1964, he said, there is no military solution to this problem of Vietnam. The solution has to be 100% political. In other words, as Colonel Davis observed in an interview published on Sunday in the state, Westmoreland knew that success or failure would be determined not by military operations alone, but by the prospect of a stable government in South Vietnam. Now let's flash forward three years, 1967, and we find him citing Clausewitz in remarks for the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. After emphasizing the multiple facets of the war, political, sociological, economic, and in the military, he drove home the point that war was fundamentally political by quoting Clausewitz, although with a twist. War is an extension of politics, Westmoreland declared, but politics is also an extension of war. Now, Lee, let us lay aside Westmoreland's theoretical outlook. What did a Clausewitzian approach mean in practice? It meant that he understood. He understood the rationale for Lyndon Johnson's decision to fight a limited war in Vietnam, a war whose political goal was not the destruction of North Vietnam, but the defense of South Vietnam. The Clausewitz outlook also meant that Westmoreland understood the political and diplomatic factors that shaped the government's decision to reject what military historians call a strategy of annihilation, a strategy that aimed for the overthrow of the Hanoi regime, because such a strategy risked American involvement in a wider and costly war in Southeast Asia. And in making this decision, the Johnson administration had, in effect, committed itself to a war of attrition a strategy that called for the gradual erosion, wearing down of not only the enemy's 
military and economic resources, but also the enemy's political will. Now what's more underlying the aspect, this aspect of the Vietnam War, when he addressed the annual meeting of the Association, Associated Press Editors in 1967. It was, he declared, a national policy to confine the war to that of limited war. And that policy has been made loud and clear by the government. At the same time, he explained that American military forces were engaged in a war of attrition. Because, as he put it, a war of annihilation had been ruled out as a matter of policy. Consequently, it was William Westmoreland's task to devise a strategy for the use of military force in South Vietnam that was consistent not only with a policy of limited war, but also with a war of attrition. Now, Westmoreland's loyalty to the concept of limited war did not mean, however, that he considered the military strategy pursued by the Johnson administration as altogether ideal. Rather, he believed that even in a limited war, the war could be fought in a more aggressive manner. And for this reason, he recommended from time to time military operations against enemy sanctuaries, the so-called enemy sanctuaries in Laos and Cambodia, and attacks on North Vietnamese bases just north of the 17th parallel, the boundary between North Vietnam and South Vietnam. But in making these recommendations, Westmoreland operated strictly through the chain of command that extended from Saigon to Washington, from his command post to the Pentagon and White House. Which brings me to the second hallmark of Westmoreland's outlook, his loyalty to what we call the American tradition of civil military relations, a tradition that calls for the military to remain subordinate to civilian authority as set forth in the Constitution. <coughs> Now, I mentioned Westmoreland's familiarity with Clausewitz's own war. He was also familiar with an American military classic, the memoirs of Civil War General Ulysses S. Grant. Even more to the point, he viewed Grant's relationship with President Abraham Lincoln as a quintessential model for civil military relations, as he observed in an address before the Lincoln Academy in Springfield in 1970. The relationship of Lincoln and Grant personified civilian faith in the military and military subordination to civilian leadership. Now some in the audience might wonder <clears throat> why I have chosen to highlight the issue of civil military relations. So let me explain. When Westmoreland assumed command in Vietnam in 1964, he was not far removed from the most controversial episode, the most dramatic crisis in the history of American civil-military relations. Only 13 years earlier, President Truman had relieved General Douglas MacArthur for insubordination, for challenging the authority of the President as Commander-in-Chief. Now, Westmoreland was not the only key official to have a vivid memory of this episode. It is especially telling that when Lyndon Johnson summoned Westmoreland to Honolulu for their first face-to-face -face meeting in February 1966, the president exclaimed, General, I hope you don't pull a MacArthur on me. The relationship that Westmoreland subsequently developed with the president suggests that Johnson's question was misplaced, unnecessary. Westmoreland did not pull a MacArthur on Johnson. As we've noted, Westmoreland had reservations about some limits that the Johnson administration placed on the conduct of war. But unlike MacArthur, he did not go public with his views. He did not write indiscreet letters to the head of the VFW. He did not attempt to go around the president by corresponding directly with the head of the opposition party in Congress. Instead, he adhered directly, strictly, to the code of conduct that he emphasized in a lecture at Kansas State University in 1969. The military must meticulously avoid actions that challenge the doctrine of civilian supremacy. Consequently, it's not surprising that in 1968, when some officials and politicians 
wanted to blame Westmoreland for perceived setbacks in Vietnam, setbacks that were as much political as military, Johnson came to Westmoreland's defense. What did Johnson say? I have never dealt with the man in whom I had more confidence. A third hallmark of William Westmoreland output. Westmoreland subscribed to a broad definition of the Army's role in American society. In this regard, he stood in the tradition of George Catlett Marshall, preeminent soldier statesman. Marshall, the Army's chief of staff in World War II, had led an army that not only defeated the armed forces of the Axis, Germany and Japan, but had assumed new missions, such as running civilian conservation corps camps, CCC camps during the Great Depression, directing the Manhattan, Pro Manhattan Project, and laying the groundwork for the reconstruction of Germany and Japan. Like Marshall, Westmoreland saw the Army's primary mission as the defense of the nation to defeat the enemy's armed forces in battle. Or in the words of the military doctrine that underlay the training of Army officers for his generation to close with and destroy the enemy. But he had a positive outlook on other roles. For instance, on the eve of his retirement as chief of staff, he directed the Army staff to prepare contingency plans for supporting a civil work <coughs> program comparable to the CCC. Westmoreland was especially proud of the Army's role in breaking down racial barriers. He had himself been on the cutting edge of this endeavor during the Korean War. When he commanded the 187th Airborne Combat Team, one of the first Army combat units to be integrated. And by the time of the Vietnam War, the <coughs> Army had, of course, made considerable progress with integration. So how did Westmoreland describe this Army? This is what he said at Kansas State. The Army has led the nation in creating a truly integrated society. <coughs> Soldiers from every race, creed, and color are working, living, and fighting side by side. He went on to say, Today, a Negro soldier is dragged from the battlefield by a white men. A white soldier lives to see another dawn <coughs> only because a Negro soldier threw himself upon an exploding grenade. And a Protestant soldier is counseled and led in prayer by a Catholic chaplain. So perhaps I should explain in conclusion why I have quoted William Westmoreland's exact views on such issues as the relationship between war and politics, the problem of civil military relations, the Army's role in society. I wanted to capture not only the content of his views, but also the precision of his speech. <coughs> and if you don't want to take my word for it, the clarity of his speech, then listen to how Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Tom Wicker described Westmoreland's presentation for the Associated Press in 1967. Wicker, who covered the event for the New York Times, wrote, Westmoreland was forceful and no loss for words or syntax in answering questions extemporaneously and displayed nimble footwork when dealing with touchy political questions. In conclusion, I think it is important that we should remember William Westmoreland not only for what he did, but for what he said. For I believe his message should have meaning for us even today. Thank you. because that was one of the things that really intrigued me in getting to uh, know the general as slightly as I did. Um, as a speaker, uh, he was uh, uh, remarkably eloquent, uh, had a tremendous vocabulary, and uh, was just a, a compelling speaker. Our second speaker is Colonel Gregory Davis, Assistant Professor in the Department of History, at the United States Military Academy. He's a graduate of the Academy and holds his MA from Villanova and his PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. <clears throat> 
He is particularly well suited to provide expert commentary on General Westmoreland's performance in Vietnam. His 2011 book, No Sure Victory, Measuring U.S. Army Effectiveness and Progress in the Vietnam War, was published by Oxford University Press to excellent reviews that praised it for its searching analysis of the problems our government had in measuring success and failure in such a complex struggle. Colonel Davis is currently working on a new book titled Westmoreland's War, Reassessing American Strategy in Vietnam, 1964 to 1968, which has been accepted for publication by Oxford University Press. I'm honored to have Colonel Davis with us today. Well, thank you, Herb, for those kind remarks, and thank you to Dean McNally. Uh, thank you all for coming, especially to Westmoreland. And uh, thank you to my old first sergeant, Horace Frazier, um, for coming. Uh, <laughs> it always means top to me. So. Uh, I, too, am, am excited to be in South Carolina, um, not because I'm a son of South Carolina, but a son of New Jersey, but just because the weather is much warmer down here. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to talk today, uh, this evening, about um, the problem of language as it relates to General Westmoreland's strategy in Vietnam. And what I'd like to uh, center my remarks around is the one word that is most associated with American uh, strategy in Vietnam, and that is the word attrition. And as Colonel Miles pointed out, the word uh, oftentimes is linked to a definition that talks about war being a prolonged conflict. And I think the best way for me to get at this this evening is to show you about 175 PowerPoint slides, talk for about three and a half hours. <laughs> now what I'd like to do is, uh, is really to talk about this problem of the word attrition. Um, because I think what it has, uh, has been misunderstood uh, for about the last 40 to 50 years, I think it's been misused uh, by more recent historians. And certainly critics of the war who, uh, who maintain that General Westmoreland, who was the commander of the U.S. Military Assistance Command in Vietnam, or MACV, from 1964 to 1965, prosecuted a ground campaign in South Vietnam throughout the 1960s, or at least the early half of the 1960s. And in doing so, he employed a flawed strategy of attrition. And in doing so, he concentrated at the expense of all other missions on killing enemy soldiers. That this was the definition of attrition. That here is an officer that is hypnotized by the prospects of high body counts. And officers like Westmoreland led the United States Army to failure because they never realized that the insurgency warfare in Vietnam required basic changes to Army methods to meet the exigencies of a new conflict of unconventional warfare. In short, that Westmoreland and officers like him just didn't get it. Now, detractors of uh, this attrition strategy will often argue that if only Westmoreland had employed a better strategy, focusing on countering the southern insurgency, rather than on the conventional threat from North Vietnam, that the Americans could have achieved victory. In fact, a recent biographer of Westmoreland's successor, Craig Abrams, has uh, contended that when Abrams took command of MACV in 1968, he immediately moved away from attrition strategy upon taking command of MACV, and instead synchronized conventional operations with an increased emphasis on securing and pacifying the countryside, and that this one war concept manifested such an enlightened and effective approach to strategy that the Americans had actually won the war in South Vietnam in 1970. A better commander fighting a better war using a better strategy had triumphed. What I would like to argue here this evening is, in fact, that is a false narrative based on um, some very um, problematic evidence. In fact, I would uh, contend this evening that William Westmoreland did not countenance an exclusive policy of attrition focused on killing enemy combatants. In fact, the very word attrition seems to have been misunderstood by contemporary critics as well as more recent historians. Westmoreland, I would argue, had his own one war approach to Vietnam that was a realistic military strategy that both recognized the complex nature of the threat and effectively 
as possible, given the limitations that you just heard, employ U.S. forces to con con combat a sophisticated enemy in both a conventional and unconventional environment. Neither counterinsurgency alone nor a singular focus on conventional combat operations could have positioned American forces in reach of victory, and Westmoreland understood that. He also, we have to realize, did in fact use the word attrition. But I would argue this evening that he did so more to express his belief that victory in Vietnam could not be achieved quickly, but rather than to demonstrate to his superior um, civilian policymakers in Washington, D.C., and to the United States public at large, that this, is, this was, a, in fact, a prolonged conflict. It's going to take me three and a half hours to get there. No, just <laughs> the fact that the United States fell in Vietnam had less to do with commanders choosing a correct or incorrect strategy for the ground war than it did with the inability of foreign forces to resolve intractable problems within South Vietnamese government and society. And that's why I think continuing to study this war and this commander is still incredibly relevant for today. Now, to the problems of the conventional narrative, if you will. And a basic pillar of that narrative is that American strategy rested on a contention that the American army and officers like Westmoreland did not understand counterinsurgency. The problem is when you look at the evidence, that contention doesn't match up very well. When Westmoreland was a superintendent from uh, West Point from 1960 to 1963, he instituted mandatory counterinsurgency training for all cadets. The Military Academy's Counterinsurgency Committee, which Westmoreland helped stand up, found that the interdisciplinary nature of the subject required cadets to study, and I quote here, the political, the military, the economic, the psychological, and the sociological aspects of unconventional <coughs> warfare. Cadets thus studied the theoretical works of Mao Zedong, of Vo Nguyen Zha. They explored the history of revolutionary struggles in the Philippines, in Malaya, and in Indochina. And upon assumption of command in Vietnam, Westmoreland took all these lessons with him to his new command, and necessarily had to follow a similar broad interpretation of political military problems involved in revolutionary warfare. Listen to the mission that Westmoreland is given by the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific of Sinkai. The objective that Westmoreland was given was to help create a stable and independent non-communist government in South Vietnam. And certainly this is a daunting task for Westmoreland and the American Army. And thus, the commander had to develop an all-encompassing concept of operations that sought not only to destroy enemy forces, but also to expand the popular percentage of South Vietnam's population under the Saigon government's control. A June 1965 cable outlining this concept noted clearly that the insurgency in South Vietnam must eventually be defeated among the people in the hamlets and towns. And as he directed his commander to his commanders a few months later, the war in Vietnam is a political as well as a military war. It is political because the ultimate goal is to regain the loyalty and cooperation of the people and to create conditions which permit, permit the people to go about their normal lives in peace and security. Now, I would argue here, and I think we even can have some discussion in the question and answer period, whether this was even a, a a reasonable, if possible, goal for American forces to achieve. Is it possible for American forces to help build linkages between a local population and its government, especially a government that may not, in fact, be seen as legitimate in a majority of the eyes of the, uh, the population? But certainly, when you look at the evidence and you look at the documents, when you look at Westmoreland's own words, you see a commander that understood the importance of relating military power to political purpose. Some might call that Clausewitzian. Certainly, Westmoreland used the word attrition in his memoirs and in his correspondence with both subordinate and senior commanders. But I would suggest that these communications, in these communications, the generals focused less on killing the enemy and more on intimating to those directing the war effort that the conflict in Vietnam would not be concluded in a swift manner. Attrition underlined the problems of fighting a protracted war. 
As Westmoreland wrote to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in June of 1965, the premise behind whatever further actions we must undertake must be that we are in for the long pull. This struggle has become a war of attrition. I see no likelihood of achieving a quick, favorable end to the war. And you see those words used over and over again, both in public and in private conversations um, between Westmoreland and his superiors. Both the threat and the mission require a broad concept of operations, one that a simple word like attrition could not fully characterize. As his chief intelligence officer, Phil Davidson, recalled, Westmoreland had not one, but three battles to fight. First, to contain a growing conventional threat. Second, to develop the Republic of Vietnam's armed forces. And third, to pacify and protect the peasants in the South Vietnamese countryside. Now, the general was under no illusions that U.S. forces were engaged in a war of annihilation aimed at the rapid destruction of the enemy. This was not World War II. Attrition suggested that a stable South Vietnam, again, we can question whether this was even within the capacity of United States forces to achieve, um, suggested that a stable South Vietnam capable of resisting the military and political pressures of both internal and external forces would not arise in a matter of months or even years. And this was an all-encompassing effort. Listen to what General Westmoreland says in early 1966. Probably the fundamental issue is the question of the coordination of mission activities in Saigon. And this sounds very much like Superintendent of West Point, uh, of West Point in, in the early 1960s. It is abundantly clear that all political, military, economic, and security programs must be completely integrated in order to attain any kind of success in a country which has been greatly weakened by prolonged conflict and is under increasing pressure by large military and subversive forces. Thus, Westmoreland's um, sustained campaign had a, a multitude of subordinate political and military tasks which defied easy explanation. What Westmoreland lacked, and I would argue, as did the entire United States Army during the Vietnam War, was a way to articulate this broad strategy and broad strategic concepts for such a complex military environment like South Vietnam. The, complex, the very complexity of fighting in South Vietnam caused immense problems with strategic articulation. The complexity of the war posed problems for language. And this impoverished strategic language left uniformed officers and their civilian leadership unable to communicate their intentions and the means to achieve their objectives. The military lexicon of the day was unsuited to the myriad tasks required of Westmoreland's command. And thus, I think because there is this lack of precise military terminology, you see officers of the day and subsequent historians embrace this word attrition. In fact, post-war survey conducted um, or concluded that 70% of Army generals managing the war were uncertain of its objectives. If attrition of enemy forces, if killing the enemy was the guiding light of strategy, one might expect more certainty among the uh, Army senior leaders. In fact, this panoptic strategy left many American field commanders in doubt of the United States' main purpose in Vietnam. Should they be killing the enemy? Should they be building linkages between the local population and its government? Should they be securing the population? Should they be pacifying the population? Words like attrition, while useful to critics, remain unsatisfying in expressing the complexity of the tasks facing Americans and, South, and their South Vietnamese allies in the 1960s. Now, certainly there were problems in implementation with this broad strategy. As one uh, U.S. advisor noted, we never articulated our massive power and abundant resources in conjunction with Vietnamese politics. An important point here. Not only is Westmoreland dealing with trying to implement this very broad strategy, but because of the nature of his objective of building this stable, non-communist South Vietnam, he also has to deal with a very complex and very unstable local political uh, landscape. And military operations most certainly caused depopulation in the countryside and often con contradicted American goals of developing a sense of stability among American people. 
despite the Americans' military operations, pacification efforts, and the training of local Vietnamese forces, enemy recruitment in the South and reinforcement from the North continued nearly unabated throughout much of the war. Tactical success is oftentimes only achieved temporary results, and we should take that into account without doubt. But killing enemy forces never was an end unto itself. Westmoreland always looked to follow combat operations immediately with pacification programs. As he spoke in his official report after the war, the pacification effort and the main force war were essentially inseparable, opposite sides of the same coin. Now, while we should take a look at Westmoreland's own um, language when trying to describe this, we should also take a look at his civilian leaders and, his, and the advisors of, the, of Johnson's <coughs> administration. As an example, if we look at Na Johnson's national security advisor, McGeorge Bundy, as he's summarizing Westmoreland's concept in September of 65, Bundy is telling the president that uh, Westmoreland's goal is to halt the enemy offensive by destroying the southern insurgents and pacifying select high-priority high areas. And then as he's explaining to the president after progressively restoring the country to governmental control, MACV would support rural reconstruction with comprehensive attention to the pacification process. One might argue this is a one-word approach to the problem of South Vietnam. If Westmoreland had been singularly committed to attriting and killing enemy forces, in this case, he had certainly duped his civilian leadership. He also would have been out of step with contemporary doctrine of the United States Army as it related to counterinsurgency. <coughs> and that counterinsurgency doctrine spoke of defeating not only the external enemy forces that were threatening the nation, but also the internal subversive forces, as Westmoreland would call them, call them the bully boys and the termites. And both of these threats, the bully boys, the main force units from outside the country, and the termites, the internal insurgents, required attention in his strategic concept, and both threatened to undermine, if not destroy, the House of South Vietnam. So too did the instability of the Saigon government, and desertions and corruption in the armed forces, and an, un and an army that was oftentimes unsympathetic to the country's peasantry, which very much so frustrated American officers and civilian leaders throughout the war. In short, not all problems inside Vietnam could be solved by American military might. And I think this is an important point for us to take, take away this evening. So in conclusion, what I'd like to just briefly wrap up is that I believe that this problem of language as we try to express and, and define the war in Vietnam using words like attrition have actually gone far in undermining a truer, better understanding of what Westmoreland was trying to achieve in the 1960s. And because of that, what you've seen is a number of if-only arguments. If only Westmoreland had paid more attention to counterinsurgency. If only he had fought a better war like his successor. If only um, the military had been allowed to widen the scope of the war. If only public support had remained strong. If only civilian leadership had been willing to see the war through. Yet among military critics in particular, this <coughs> idea that attrition and a failed strategy represented the reason why Americans lost in Vietnam remains strong and remains at the heart of the arguments of why the Americans lost in Vietnam. And I think we should all be careful with that argument um, because it overly simplifies and reduces a complex war to one word. And I think that, war, that word is unsatisfying. Attrition of the enemy certainly ranked as an important element of the war, but never did Westmoreland see this as a sole purpose of his mission. And his inability to remedy the ingrained problems, if not inconsistencies, within South Vietnam society demonstrated more the limits of American military power abroad than the defects of this one general strategic concept. In the end, finding the right strategy may not have been the key to victory in Vietnam. introduction recounting the career of General Volney Warner 
would require the rest of our entire evening. So please excuse me in giving this capsule introduction. He's a 1950 graduate of the Academy who began his long and storied military career in Korea, where he saw combat as an infantry platoon leader. He has held staff and command positions and served our country in stations around the world, including Vietnam, where he served from 1963 to 1965. And from 1970 to 72, Warner served as the executive officer and senior aide to Army Chief of Staff William Childs Westmoreland. General Warner holds a master's degree in psychology from Vanderbilt University and a master's of science in international relations from George Washington University and has taught at the academy. He retired from the Army in 1981 and has enjoyed a successful business career since that time. We are honored to have General <coughs> Warner and his family with us tonight. Well, it's good to be here. You're lucky because I can only talk as long as I can stand up. That <laughs> <laughs> all collapse will all be over. <laughs> but it is great to be here to see Kitsy and all of us more on the with his camera once again. And to have an opportunity to commemorate uh, General Westmoreland, with whom I worked for quite some time. But before I start, I have to do full disclosure on some personal views that might be shared, might not be, but that have developed over the years. I really worked on uh, <coughs> Vietnam for about 10 years, including uh, two years in the White House when the president was trying to wind it down. And then also had the Southeast Asia desk for a while in the Army staff, had the Vietnam desk. If you want to blame somebody from the war, there are a lot of people that could be blamed. You could probably put me even on that small list. But my view is that uh, we did not lose the war in Vietnam. It was never ours to win. And if you start with that approach, you come up with a little different idea with respect to the words. As far as the uh, General Westmoreland goes, there's no question in my mind that he gave it his very best all the time, every day, every year he was there. And given the mission that he was by his commander in chief, the President of the United States, I can't think of anything more difficult for a professional soldier than to be given the mission to win an unwinnable war. But that's the situation in which he found himself at the time. I think it was extremely unfortunate that at the political level, we began to look at the war as the falling of dominoes. And if we didn't draw a line in the sand and stop communism in Southeast Asia, all the other dominoes would fall one after the other. And we'd be at risk here in the United States. <clears throat> Quick answer to that is not so. The, really, the, the driven ideology that drove the war in, uh, in Vietnam, in retrospect, if you look back, was not communism, it was nationalism. And Ho Chi Minh and the North Vietnamese were going to integrate the North and the South, and they didn't care how many soldiers they killed for doing it, or how many bombs we dropped as a cause of it. And no amount of iron dropped on the South was going to create, uh, or adopt on the North really, was going to create a viable government in the South. We tried that, it didn't work. We gave it our best, but it didn't come out the way we anticipated it would. In, uh, again, looking back, the uh, 58,000 names on a wall and wall is just too high a price to pay to get a new trading partner in Southeast Asia and buffer the Chinese. Shame on us. That's the way it turned out, is the way it started. But nonetheless, it was the way it sort of wound up. Back to uh, the more pleasant things. I first met General Westmoreland on the drop zone in 1959 in Fort Campbell over to 101st. I had uh, been sent down to Vanderbilt 
to go to school, be prepared to go up to West Point to teach. And I had decided in my master's thesis, rather than run white rats or college sophomores, that soldiers would be a lot more fun as subjects. So I came over to Campbell, got permission, I think Jack Singlaw, to go out and see what the effects of fear would be on people as a consequence of throwing themselves out of an aircraft in flight, which is a pretty good way to see clear fear, both when they come out and when they hit the ground. And I was walking around the DZ trying to interview people that had just exited the aircraft. I'd spoken with quite a few before they got on, trying to see if the big ones had more fear or less fear, all the drill, enough to get a degree. <laughs> all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes this very, very impressive looking man. And even though I was a captain in civilian clothes, I still knew what a general looked like. <laughs> it was a major general, it was General Westmore. And he came over and said, who are you and where are you from? So I told him what my mission was. And he said, well, that's very interesting. Then he said, uh, have you been through airborne school? I said, no, I went directly to Korea in 1950, didn't have the chance. He said, oh, I can fix that. <laughs> <laughs> you really ought to go through the experience yourself if you're going to write about it. So he did. He told the G1 to change my orders, <laughs> which he did. And I wound up in the uh, 101st Airborne School there for about 45 days. And then at the, out, at the end of it, the graduation, he told me, well, you know, I'm going to West Point too. I'll see you up there. <laughs> and basically, that's what happened. I went up there and I tried to apply my schooling from Vanderbilt and tried to get into the humanities and psychology, sociology, some of the soft skills. Those of us who hated the Press Whitney Trust and didn't care for the engineering that much thought it'd be great if we could sort of water it down a little bit with some of this. And I looked up one day teaching the first class and here in the back is General Westmoreland. And at the end of it, he came up and said, you know, we have to do some other things here at the Academy. And uh, more or less goes back to your words. He said, uh, how about putting together a, a class in uh, human relations for first class and uh, social psychology also for the yearlings and see if you can put it together and then get some other people and we'll try to let MPNL, military psychology and leadership began to bring some of the soft subjects into the curriculum, which is what we did. And it was on his mind then. And uh, so we made a pretty heroic effort to try and soften the engineering just a little bit. And uh, strangely enough, shortly thereafter, I wound up going into Vietnam. And of course, he was there. He had taken over command. Uh, I was down in the Delta and looked at Vietnam through a, an advisor's straw, which is rather a small view of what was going on. And we were in the UN, UN forest area looking for Colonel Rowe who had been captured and we were going down to Canal 8. Some of you have probably been there. It's very exciting, very exciting to have Vietnamese women, 30 years old, 32, be life expectancy, beetle nut tinged teeth, run up, try to pull out your body hair because the French who had been there before us didn't have any. Pinched their noses together to imitate the French. We, had, we thought we were back about 200 years in civilization in the Delta. And I remember after that experience, when I came back to the States, I had somewhat of a different view of, of Vietnam than many of my contemporaries. And was pulled in by Chief of Staff, then General Johnson, who put about 12 of us down in the basement of the Pentagon, and he himself had reservations. He had a lot of reservations. And he wasn't sure as to whether or not we should deploy conventional military forces into Vietnam. And we were about three quarters of the way through the study when the decision was made to do it, so that we were a little bit slow in trying to say, no, if we're gonna fail in the effort over there, if we're not able to convince the Vietnamese to swear fealty to their own national government if they continue to regard it as something that they're not willing to support, then it's very unlikely a U.S. advisor down the Delta or anywhere else for that matter can go ahead and bridge that and make them declare their government worth the effort. 
So it's better to withdraw at the advisory level than it is to put 500,000 troops on the ground. And we need to think about that. We got the paper in too late. And of course, the deployment started and continued on. And uh, all the rest of us stayed in various jobs over there trying to do our best. I came back to the States again after that experience. Having been in the Delta as an advisor, I think an advisory unit number two that came in, the next time I deployed, I had a brigade up in Lake Cuba in the 4th Division. So I had a chance to look at it at the advisory provincial level, trying to fight the other war, the non-kinetic war, if you would, another word that people misuse <coughs> terribly frequently, and then also to get up and try attrition, search and destroy, whatever you want to call it, and see if we could integrate the war. And so I looked at both ends of it, and I was still very confused as to whether I thought it was possible or not, and whether this was a legitimate mission for U.S. military <coughs> forces to deploy and try to actively change the, really the interior functioning of, the, of, the, of another country. And I wasn't all that sure. And uh, so I came back to Saigon. I'd been there about uh, eight or nine months. My phone rang in the hooch. I went out and I picked it up and it was Bill Steele. And Bill Steele was General Westmoreland's exec. You all remember him and he said, uh, if I were to ask you to come home and be uh, General Westmoreland's executive officer, would you say yes or would you say no? It was kind of a strange way to put the question. So I said to him, what do you mean would I say yes or would I say no? Are you saying come back or not? He said, well, nobody gets to say no to him around here, which I thought was kind of interesting. So if you're gonna say no, I'm not asking you the question. <laughs> I said, hey, it'd be great. I'm ready to go home. I've been over here long enough. I began to look more like them. I've even got black pajamas. <laughs> so uh, he said, well, come home. You get picked. He wants you to come into the office and be his exec for his last two years of active duty. So I did. I had already briefed him on this study that General Johnson directed that we do, which was basically how do you pacify Vietnam if it takes 50 years? And there weren't too many people that were interested in being there for 50 years because of blood and treasure cost and the time cost wasn't going to turn out all that well. So I got there, and uh, General Westmoreland said, well, you briefed me once, now brief me again on your Proven study and all the things you said about the need to bring the pacification program along with the kinetic effort to try and catch all those uh, North Korean units, or, or rather North Vietnamese units that are wandering all over the countryside. So we did, and he said, uh, all right, the things that you wanted to do were pretty much the things that, uh, that I'm trying to do and I wanted to do. And so it was kind of interesting because he said, uh, all right, if you work for me and if you help me run the office and you give me time to run the Army, uh, I'll listen to anything you have to say with respect to how to make it a better war. Didn't have to wait for so uh, So we did. And it was really a, a magical moment for me as a, as a young colonel to sit at his right side, listen to what he had to say, and uh, have an opportunity to say to him, well, this is something you really ought to consider. And I don't think there was a single thing that I mentioned to him that he should consider that he didn't give a very good, serious answer to, and either task the Army staff, which was not happy as far as the Army staff is concerned, try and have them sort out and take a look at, uh, at what it was we were proposing in the way of change. But throughout all that, whenever I would overstep or someone else would, General DePue had a tendency to have a long step, would tell him you must do this and you must tell General Abrams to do this, his answer was no, I'm a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Abrams is running the war in Vietnam at this time, I only correspond with him through the Joint Staff. I gave him no orders, no directions, so you can forget about me telling him what he ought to do. Then it was interesting because it was obvious that before he left, back to Greg's point, he had divided the war up. And he had taken the recommendations that we had in the study group. And he gave uh, Ambassador Comer a little hat with four stars on it. And said, Ambassador Comer, you are now my deputy. 
and to you is the responsibility for the pacification program in Vietnam to set up the court system, which is a revolutionary development support effort to direct itself at the civilians in Vietnam. And then General Abrams, you're responsible to Vietnamize the war as soon as you can. And uh, meanwhile, we'll try and do as best we can against the North Vietnamese that are wandering around the war. So he had it divided up. It was more of a division of responsibility than it was a mistaken identity of the war. And he knew better how to run down the hardcore units by the time he got toward the end of his tour there than anybody else did. And the business of putting battalions next to the boundary to entice the into Laos and Cambodia and then to rain artillery and everything else down on top of them turned out to be a very productive way <coughs> added to that terrible thing called body count. But, you know, war is a terrible thing. So uh, he, he really put that in motion before he left Vietnam. When he came back, his number one effort was to figure out how are we going to bend down the army, bend down the army now when it comes back to Vietnam. So he spent a considerable time, Paul was there for a lot of that, on how to bring the Army back to the United States, figure out where they were going to stay, realizing at the time that the post camps and stations in the United States were based on World War II and 90 or 100 divisions that fought that war, and we couldn't sustain that base in the United <coughs> States forever, so we had to figure out how to take the units back from Vietnam, figure out what they were going to do, where they were going to go. And at the same time, to more or less uh, recondition the officer of the NCO Corps, Europe had literally been torn apart because all the people in Europe were used as replacements going into Vietnam. <coughs> there were very few units there that were at full strength, and they were in terrible condition. And the units, well, I must say, in the States, Many of the people coming out of Asia came back with drug habits that were hard to sustain. And we had a terrible problem with the drug problem rising. We had uh, so many people in the streets in the early 70s that were already attacking the war and everybody that uh, was associated with it. He found himself unwanted, but he found himself the uh, really lightning rod for everybody who had something bad to say about the war or good to say about the war. And. Uh, Nonetheless, instead of backing off, he accelerated his trips around the countryside to try and explain the war to the people, and more so than that, to go ahead and visit the post camps and stations where the veterans were and the soldiers were <coughs> reserved for him and tried to execute this, the strategy however ill informed it might have been. And he wouldn't stop that. And uh, Rip tried to get him, I think, at one time to stop his court case, and he wouldn't stop that either. <laughs> Once he made up his mind, he was going to do it, and you might as well help, because you're not going to be able to get it. <laughs> and he maintained that positive attitude right up to the end. And we had some of the, the strangest things that happened. For example, I remember a call that came into our office from someone named Kitsy. And she said, I have two hippies on my front steps over here at Pryor, one's playing a banjo, the other's singing. Can you please call the MPs and get them on the front porch? <laughs> probably remember that. We also had a four-star general who was a very, very fine man, General Haynes, no longer with us, who when we were having this terrible minor problem with the haircut length in the 70s, it was minor to a lot of people. Uh, the Army decided they would take a picture of various people with haircuts. General Haynes came to my desk one day with that picture. He was holding it, and he was furious. And he said, I want to see General Westmoreland immediately. And I said, well, can you tell me why, General? He says, no, if you want to hear it, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> so I went in, yes, and he held the picture up to General Westmoreland and said, was this taken before they had the haircut or after they had the haircut? <laughs> <laughs> it was a little long. So we, we at least had some sort of fun days when things happened like that, that uh, sometimes were better. I told you the one last night, we literally worked him from uh, six in the morning till eight at night. At that time, the Pentagon worked every day but Sunday. And as you pointed out, don't let Depew come over here on Sunday, although he did, and so did others, to try and get to, to the chief to have some time to sit down on the front porch and deal with more substantive matters. <coughs> 
So we had that business of running a schedule. And when he would come back from trips, he would be so tired. He would, uh, as one young aide did, turned out the lights in the office, the chief's office, put blankets down the couch, moved it away from the door. And when the chief came in, obviously tired, opened the door and told him to take a nap. Bad, bad mistake. <laughs> we could tell him anything other than he was tired. I think just as, as you commented on, he, he really didn't want to be tired. And so to break that up, I think uh, Paul took him on a trip, a golf trip with uh, Bob Pope. He loved that. The aide didn't because he had to stuff the bag full of bones and all, all kinds of ways, catching where he happened to be. But uh, nonetheless, that was kind of an interesting time. So we had a lot of fun. He was a great man to work with, and it was an exciting time. And I, I have nothing but the fondest memories of him and the way that the Westmoreland family took us on board. Thank you. We thought we'd take some uh, questions and, and answers uh, for our panel. Uh, probably take about 10 or 15 minutes worth. So, anybody have a question for anyone that's spoken? Chris Eversman, um, I'm very interested in <clears throat> any information or evidence you have with regards to General Westmoreland and his opinion of the Marines and uh, how he employed them. The, uh, Some of the initial days were, were really strange, and not because the Marines were strange, I don't mean that. <laughs> but uh, General Green, who was the Commandant of the Marine Corps at the time, thought that the Marines really belonged down in the Delta. And if the Marines came into the Delta, and we managed to convince the Chinese nationalists in some way to put together LCBPs and be able to, to navigate and come join him, that the war could move from the Delta North rather than come into the North. So that was the first indication where that got voted down that it was going to be a difficult time and the Joint Chiefs agree on what course it would go where. The next time it happened was when the argument came about as to whether the CAP team is run by the Marine Corps, the Civic Action Teams, which are touted as being very good, and they really were, were a cost-effective way to pursue the war because the Marines on the delivering the, uh, the CAP program to the villages sustained a great number of casualties, not like they do in Afghanistan now, but they were on foot, no armored vehicles, no protection, and uh, like the rest of, really in the advisory group, where we were doing more uh, humanitarian good with two APCs, you know, and a bottle of water, that you could probably do in a lifetime here. And the Marines really wanted to move out into the villages, and they did an extremely good job of it. But their casualty rate picked up dramatically compared to everybody else. And uh, so it became an argument with uh, some senior members of the Marine Corps as to which is the best way to proceed as far as the operational tactic goes on the ground, to the extent that uh, General Westmoreland sent another three-star up in that area over the third map, I think it was, to, uh, to function more as his band in the Marine Corps to make sure that they had a better operational integration of what they were trying to do. You know, this, this, these were operational arguments, not personal arguments, based on, you know, a long time in the country and a difference of opinion. Because if you, it's a long way to the field from create a, a free and independent South Vietnam all the way down to what is the best way to distribute uh, APCs in the countryside. I think just from my perspective, um, my own research leads me to believe that, that, that there was actually more um, continuity between the, the Army approach and the Marine approach. In fact, I've, I've seen a number of, uh, of Army War College uh, student essays that were written in 1966, 1967, talking about the Marine approach to civic action and revolutionary development and the Army approach 
and how similar those approaches were rather than different. And again, I think this leads, um, this is part of the myth of the, of the, the if only approach, that if only General Westmoreland had followed the Marine approach, uh, he would have been more effective because uh, he would have been more focused on population security like the Marines were. Um, but what I found in my own research is in fact Westmoreland was, um, was deeply concerned about pacification and population security. And when you start looking at the actual um, documents, there isn't all that much difference between the Marine approach and, and what a number of other units in the Army were, uh, were trying to achieve. As an example, in, uh, in the southern region uh, where the 25th Infantry Division was operating, the U.S. Army 20, 25th Infantry Division, they were instituting a combined lightning initial project which was operating almost along the identical lines as the, uh, as the CAP program. And as General Warner said, I, I think uh, there was this issue that, that the CAP program was much too expensive, it was much too risky, especially in the Marine Corps area, which was up north along the border that had a very, not only an unconventional threat, but also a conventional threat that, that uh, the Marines in Westmoreland had to deal with and couldn't choose between one or the other. And again, I think that's a, a key point to take away um, from the discussion of American strategy, both U.S. Army and Marine Corps, that it was never an either-or approach, that it was much more comprehensive, um, and that both Westmoreland and Abrams understood they couldn't choose counterinsurgency over conventional operations or vice versa, that they had to um, prosecute both types of campaigns simultaneously. Thank you. Another question? The question of that CBS suit still lingers in the popular mind, and it doesn't mind too because we hate to see defamation of character on the gentleman and the scholar and the leader of General Westmoreland. But nevertheless, historically, that perception of defamation in the minds of many still exists. So may I ask the gentleman how you view that lawsuit CBS 1982, which we remember seeing that, how we should remember that, how we should perceive that here in 2013. That's the question. I'll, I guess I'll start with the, the actual controversy. If, if I could maybe talk more about the original controversy and then if you want to talk more about the suit. The, the original controversy was over, uh, was the was an argument made that Westmoreland was basically knowingly lowering the estimates of enemy forces operating in South Vietnam, basically the insurgency, was purposefully lowering the uh, enemy forces to, to show progress in the war, that he was, uh, in a sense, lying about the amount of progress that was being made. Um, and I would argue that that is, in fact, a myth. Um, in large part, I believe it's a myth because there was heated debate between the CIA and MACB headquarters over how to count the enemy. Um, should you count an enemy um, propagandist? Is that considered an enemy or not? If, if you plant rice five days of the week and on the weekend you serve as a political cadre, do I count you or not? If you are operating six days out of the week but on, on Sunday you actually serve as a scout do I count you or not? So there's this huge debate that's occurring um, in 1966 and 1967 over how just to count the enemy. And it's not just among the Americans, it's also among the South Vietnamese as well. The problem with this idea that, that Westmoreland is lying to his superior officers is that everybody in the Johnson administration knew about the debate. The president himself knew that the CIA and MACD headquarters were debating this. Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, knew that MACD headquarters um, was not coming up with the same numbers that the CIA, that, um, that they were having an argument over how to count, uh, count self-defense forces, enemy self-defense forces, and secret self-defense forces. As Craig Abrams uh, wrote to uh, the Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, this is when Westmoreland is, um, is back in the United States, um, and, and questioning whether the Army and MACD headquarters should count women and children in, as part of these self-defense and, and secret self-defense forces. That if they're rarely armed, if they have no discipline, it is, at least in the Western conception of discipline, they may not have military capability. 
Um, so this debate occurs throughout 1967, and ultimately um, they, they come to a, a kind of an uneven consensus over, over the number. I personally think this has relevance for today, and, and, and again, this is from the original controversy, less about the, the follow on. I think this has incredible relevancy today because I would argue we're still dealing with this problem in Afghanistan and we dealt with it in Iraq. How do we count an, an Afghani that, or an Afghan uh, civilian that may provide information to Al Qaeda or the Taliban? How do we <coughs> count an Iraqi civilian that is um, maybe offering some intelligence, but, but not willingly so, or um, it, it's, a, it's a problem that the American Army and, and the Marines, um, or not just Allied Ground Forces in Iraq and Afghanistan have struggled with over the last decade, and I still think has relevance today, because I think what this, this gets to is this broader interpretation of what warfare in fact is. And as, as Pearl Miles mentioned earlier, if war is in fact more about military operations and just as much about politics, then maybe, in fact, we should count somebody in the roles that is doing more than just military operations, but is concerning themselves with propaganda or political indoctrination. So I, feel, I still think it's relevant to today. Just to add one point, I think it's the same thing that you're saying, but if, if you accept that the major mission to General Warner, or General Warner, that General Westmoreland saw for himself was the destruction of the uh, Pavan force, the hardcore North Vietnamese force that came in over the parallel. Well, and if you look at the Viet Cong as the political arm of Hanoi, those are two distinct different forces. Uh, then uh, if somebody asked me to report and I'm in charge of killing the hardcore forces, how many forces oppose me, I'm not gonna really be sitting there thinking about the political arm, the VC, the people in the villages, the rough buff, the SDF, the provincial forces, you don't make that sort of an arithmetic uh, combination. So I think it was a bad hit. And generally, the idea that uh, General Westmoreland would lie to anybody is so inconceivable to me in the time that I've known him that it's hard for me to state that. If he had a fault, it was exactly the opposite. It was too easy for somebody else to lie to him. Let me just uh, drive home the point that uh, Colonel Daddy's made, the thrust of his comment. Um, there were two phrases that captured the attention of the public when that program was announced and then broadcast. The first was the title of the program, The Uncounted Enemy. And as Colonel Daddy's has, uh, I think, uh, explained, there were legitimate debates over how to count the enemy. And those debates were known at the highest level. Which brings me to the second phrase, conspiracy. When CBS announced the program, it was publicized as a program to reveal that there had been a conspiracy within the military, orchestrated by General Westmoreland, to shield Lyndon Johnson from the truth now, the idea that you could sort of shield Lyndon Johnson <laughs> and while a Texas politician, that somehow you could outmaneuver him, I mean, I think that in itself is questionable. But beyond that, the evidence that was presented during the uh, trial of uh, Westmoreland versus the CBS is that all of Johnson's senior advisors were well aware of the debate. They understood the reasons why there could be disagreement over how you would count the enemy. William Bundy, Assistant Secretary of State for Far Eastern Affairs, testified to that effect. Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, testified to that effect. Walt Rostow, the President's National Security Advisor, testified to that effect. Now, after they testified, what happened? Boys, hey, with boys, Senior counsel for CBS said, oh, well, we really didn't mean conspiracy. That was an awkward choice of words on our part. CBS withdrew that terminology. They were not going to defend that. But in some ways, the damage had been done, given your observation about the uh, impact on the public. Uh, one other comment, if you want to just read something about that uh, episode, I always recommend to my students and others a uh, book 
titled Reckless Disregard, as in one of the elements for libel, Reckless Disregard of the Truth, written by a very uh, formidable female journalist named <laughs> Renata Adler, who wrote for the New Yorker magazine. And Renata Adler had the reputation of being very liberal. She would be considered by some as being very radical. She was certainly a very colorful personality. I can testify to that. I believe the West Orleans will agree. <laughs> Listen, she was assigned by New Yorker to cover West Orleans versus CBS. She approached that assignment what? With a negative outlook on William Westmoreland. During the course of the trial, she completely reversed her position and ended up writing articles that were sympathetic to General Westmoreland's point of view, which got her into trouble with some of her fellow journalists. But then she collected those articles and published them in this uh, book, Reckless Disregard, which tells you a lot about how CBS produced that program. Classic case of cherry picking the evidence Choosing not to interview, for example, uh, General uh, Davidson, whom you quoted. If there's anybody who would known something about how intelligence was compiled, it was the, the J-2, the chief of intelligence. And the producer of the program, when I challenged him on that, said, well, I was told that he was ill. <laughs> ill. Well, he chose just not to interview him. And oh, I, mean, I was not back in Vietnam at the time. But I knew something about the episode, being familiar with General Westmoreland's papers. And, um, well, he could have uh, maybe interviewed me when he was putting the program together. And, and, he, and he said, I, I should have interviewed you. I might have understood some issue more clearly. But that was after the event. After the event. One last question. Bill uh, Barber. Um, you have stated that General Westmoreland was quite comfortable with civilian chain of command in the Army, but I was curious how he reconciled himself with the endless meddling and micro managing that McNamara and his boys and LBJ did on the operational level, the rules of engagement and party selection coming down from Washington. As a military man, how did he deal with that internally? Well, let, let me uh, respond, at least in part. I, Johnson meddled more with the air war. That is where Johnson really examined in detail the conduct of the war and selected targets and poured over maps with Secretary McNamara. And General Westmoreland was not responsible for the air war. I guess we should have made pre-emphasized that from the beginning. He was responsible for the conduct of the war within South Vietnam. The air war, from the very beginning, was directed, the military direction was from Honolulu, Commander-in-Chief in Pacific, and then it went with chain of command from him to Washington. Johnson did not interfere with operations on the ground in South Vietnam the way he interfered with the conduct of the air war. I would say, other than prescribing those limits, which he prescribed very explicitly in June of 1965, a National Security Council meeting and then reiterated from time to time, uh, we will have no wider war. I want no wider war. And as Gerald Westmoreland said two years later to the Associated Press, everyone got that message loud and clear. There was no confusion about the policy with respect to limited war. So he placed those geographical limits on ground operations. Then he obviously made decisions about troop levels. Those all had to be cleared with him. How many <coughs> troops were being deployed and at what time. Beyond that, if there was anyone asking questions about the conduct of operations on the ground in South Vietnam, the questions came primarily from <coughs> the Joint Chiefs of Staff and more precisely General Wheeler. But uh, General Westmoreland was, I would say, given pretty much a free reign with regard to con the conduct of operations on the ground. <coughs>
to make one observation. Right. <coughs> you said that, well, as I understand it, that CBS had that program and uh, uh, they uh, implied that uh, Westmoreland and the generals were shielding uh, Lyndon Johnson. And for various reasons of in the CIA and Max and so forth. Converse of that is that by the very nature of the program, CBS is shielding Lyndon Johnson and the Democrats under the election. <laughs> well, I bet. That, that is the bottom line of the whole thing. You understand, and that same thing applies today. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are those who agree with you that at times the media we can talk has its own. Ben and we can keep on going. <laughs> there are times when the media has its own agenda. We know that, and I think, and no doubt, that the CBS had a particular agenda at the time. And with that, we'll bring the evening to the close. We have a wonderful exhibit of the General's collection out in the gallery. We've got refreshments. Um, out front, and let's thank our speakers. Again for the